Hi everyone. Um, welcome to you all for being here today. Um, my name is Polomi and I work as a product manager at BioRad. My job is basically to um, work on developing new tools uh, that help in better detection and quantification of proteins, uh, specifically in Western blotting application. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about uh, the different ways that you can be cognizant about your technique um, as well as new uh, technologies and reagents that are available to make your Western blot a lot more quantitative, a lot more quantitative um, and hence publication ready. So let's get started. I cannot imagine a, a protein um, lab that has never done Western blotting. I mean, no matter what kind of scientific question you're trying to interrogate, you have always done you know, Western blotting in some form or the other. Uh, so it's a pretty ubiquitous and powerful technique that people across the different fields of science use. Uh, and that's reflected by the number of uh, the percentage of publications uh, in JBC that uh, showcase some form of Western blotting data. A little bit of history to pique your interest. The first Western blot um, was done in 1979 by uh, Tobin and colleagues, and that's the publication where they talk all about their technique. Um, what they used is basically two scotch bright pads, uh, and they used uh, iodine-labeled um, secondary antibodies. It took them six days to expose that blot and get an image. And we've come a long, long way from, from that kind of technique and technology to image and detect proteins, right? So here I am to talk about uh, new technologies, new developments, and technique-related um, things that you can do to get a better Western blot. We all know the different steps of Western blotting. So it starts with sample prep. You run the gel. You transfer proteins onto a membrane, followed by blocking, uh, immunodetection, and then some form of quantification and analysis. It's really important to be cognizant of all the different things that you can do right, even before you begin loading your samples onto a Western blot. And I'll start with sample prep and go through all the steps of Western blotting um, within the given time that we have. So essentially, the goal of this step is to make sure that you've broken your cell membrane and then actually released all the proteins that are contained inside the cell to the best of your ability. So it's really important to know what kind of lysis buffer condition to use based on the kind of target protein that you're looking for. As well as the lysis technique, it depends on how harsh or how gentle you want your lysis technique to be based on the kind of cells you're working with and the kind of target protein you're looking for. So for example, so if you're, if you're working on uh, bacterial um, cells, for example, you might need a lysozyme treatment to break open the cell wall, things like that. It's just important to know what kind of technique you're going to use for the best possible solubilization of your proteins into solution for your, to load your Western blot. This is also something I've seen fairly frequently in, in, my, in uh, my research career as well as uh, others, which is we generally tend to just spin down and take the supernatant and load it onto um, a, a gel. But it's also important to know what kind of protein are you dealing with and does it actually come out all in the supernatant or some of it stays back in the pellet or a lot of it stays back in the pellet, for example. So it's important to know about these things that are dictated by biology and uh, by the properties of that protein, how hydrophobic it is, for example. So one of the best practices that I want to basically underline here is that you need to confirm that you have completely solubilized all the proteins in your cell before you have actually gone on and loaded your Western blot. Choosing the right gel buffer chemistry. I, s I have seen that you know, across the board, uh, trisglycine is the most common type of gel chemistry people use. And sometimes we tend to be stuck to that method just because it has been done in the past. So it's just important to know you have all of these different um, uh, chemistries available to you depending on what you're trying to do. Now having said that, um, this is the most common one, the trisglycine uh, chemistry. And what Biorad has done is that it has, um, it, has, uh, it offers a gel that you know, goes through the same chemistry but has an extended shelf life. So hence you can you know, store your gels for up to a year. Uh, 
And we also have this technology where a, a halo, a tri-halo compound is actually added into the, into the solution that is used to cast the gel. So you can um, quantify your total protein load that you run on each lane without having to stain. So it's a stain-free method of detecting proteins that you have run in, in the lane. So essentially, you, you can detect the entire protein load that you have um, loaded onto that lane without having to stain your gel and destain the gel. So it's a nifty little way of you to be um, qualitatively looking for all the different steps along the way that you run your Western blot. This can help you check, okay, have I run, you know, all the proteins, are they gone through the gel properly? Are, are the bands looking crisp? Then once you transfer, you can image the gel again to make sure that all the proteins have been transferred from the gel onto the membrane. So it helps you check stepwise, you know, the, the fidelity of your technique. Choosing the right gel percentage, I don't want to dwell too much on this because everybody who runs a Western blot knows about this. Uh, if you're trying to detect pro different proteins um, that have widely different molecular weights, uh, you can use a gradient gel, you can use you know, low or high percentage gels depending on the molecular weight of the target protein you're looking for. Choosing the right protein standard. Sometimes uh, this can really be important when you're trying to benchmark, especially if you're purifying a protein and then you're trying to load it and you know, um, trying to prove that you have purified the right protein. And people sometimes use native um, proteins for this purpose, so they can actually look at the, what the biologically relevant version of that protein uh, where it runs on the gel. Most people would reuse recombinant protein standards, which are much precise and, because you are using uh, engineered proteins um, to benchmark the band. Loading best practices. I cannot um, emphasize this enough, and I have seen that people would go ahead and do a BCA assay um, on something where they have um, EDTA in the buffer. So EDTA is a metal chelator, so you cannot really use a, a copper chemistry-based protein assay to accurately quantify your protein if you have EDTA in the buffer. So it's really important to realize that you know, the buffers the, and, the, and the protein chemistry you're going to use to quantify your protein is important. Um, and this can really put you off because you, can, you could be loading here not knowing. So this is the saturated range. You really want to be here where your Western blot will be much more quantitative. And in this uh, regard, less is really more. You do not want to overload. You want to be in that linear part of the loading regime. So every, you know, your, the signal intensity is actually proportional to the amount of protein expressed and loaded onto that lane. This is also important sometimes when we have, um, you know, to, to make the sample settle down well into the well, because sometimes it happens that it just spills over. It doesn't have enough um, mass to put it, uh, you know, properly settle down into the well. So add enough glycerol in the buffer to make sure you might use a 2x uh, version if needed. Running the gel, we all have encountered this where we are working with a 7.5% gel and the gel heats up, you try to uh, create your transfer sandwich and the gel breaks. Uh, so it's really important to know that you know, overheating can happen sometimes and it can also create cer certain kinds of artifacts um, in, your, in your final results. Transfer. Um, the most common type of membrane that people use is nitrocellulose. It's fairly versatile um, and it works across the board for most kinds of proteins. However, there are other options like PVDF, which is more uh, for hydrophobic proteins. And if you want to strip and reprobe, uh, which I do not advertise, uh, advertise doing, but you know, if you have to do that, then PVDF is a much more hardier membrane for you to do that. Uh, there is a low fluorescence version of PVDF that's ideal for fluorescent Western blotting detection methods. And this also depends on the kind, the membrane format you use. Most uh, academic labs um, I have seen um, would use the, uh, a membrane roll, but if you're doing high throughput, uh, you want to save time, you're just running way too many of these uh, blots, you might want to use pre-cut or pre-wetted membranes. Then comes the pore size. There are two options for you, uh, you know, this can be used across the board, but also remember that uh, this limits the, um, the, the transfer ability of the, of the membrane, being the smaller pore size. So for most applications, the 0.45 micron membrane is the most commonly used one. Transfer, again, I don't want to dwell too much on this because everybody knows about bubbles. And if you're detecting protein loaded at low levels, your sample is just way too precious. In that situation, you know, you might want to go with the smaller pore size membrane so it doesn't run through uh, across the membrane.
Uh, again, incomplete transfer uh, is always a problem, especially for higher molecular weight proteins. And so it, the stain-free technology is particularly useful in this respect because you can actually validate the fact that you have transferred all the protein that you had loaded onto the gel onto your membrane. So you have a good way to validate before you even spend your antibodies and your time doing immunodetection and quantitation later on. Heating is also something that we need to be cognizant about, spe specifically when you have proteins that are more um, amenable to changes in their structure and hence will um, have problems binding your primary antibody if, you, if the membrane gets too heated. Wet versus dry transfer. This is really a matter of choice. It's just that it's very cumbersome to have that huge, you know, tank sitting with a ton of buffer, then in an ice bucket or taking that into the cold room. It's just cumbersome. So uh, semi-dry or dry transfer is, um, you know, an easier uh, way to do this. And to, to help you do that more effectively, Biorad has these transfer packs that are pre-assembled for you um, and pre-wetted uh, with the membrane and the, and the filter in there. Uh, drying of a membrane, this is a little tip that I got uh, because I worked on ubiquitination during my postdoc days and we had to autoclave the blots to actually try to immobilize these small ubiquitin chains onto the blot. So it's something uh, cool to know that you have this, uh, you know, if you, if you have a problem of the protein not being immobilized on the membrane well enough, this is something you could try out. It doesn't work for every kind of protein though. Blocking reagent, there's a whole host of blocking reagents available these days, uh, milk being the most common one and the most versatile one. However, for certain applications, milk doesn't work well. So you need to make sure that you are actually choosing the blocking condition that works best for your protein of interest. For example, sometimes um, specialized blocking buffers are important for fluorescence western blotting to reduce noise. It's also important to note that sometimes um, non-mammalian blocking buffers are important so your antibody doesn't cross-react. Antibodies. This is the w single most important reagent in your western blotting workflow. You can have the most amazing technique and bad antibodies and you'll get a bad western blot. So hence it's important to validate and understand how your antibody works when you make that choice. And best practice is always, you know, you need to practice and optimize the dilution and the conditions that you incubate that antibody in for your sample and your protein of interest. There's no shortcut to this really. I mean, you can go about this very systematically to reduce the amount of work you do, but there's just no shortcut to you know, doing this prior due diligence before you spend your valuable samples trying and trying and trying, but doing the same thing over and over is not gonna yield a different result, right? In terms of secondary antibodies, uh, again, there's a little bit, you know, if you have a good primary and you have cross-absorbed uh, cross secondary antibodies, you have a good chance of actually uh, detecting your target protein in, in the membrane. Uh, again, same story, you need to titrate the dilution and the, and the conditions. Immunodetection, obviously, a lot of people do it in the, in the traditional chemiluminescent way, where your secondary antibody is tagged to a peroxidase and you're adding a substrate and converting that to product and detecting light. Uh, and there are substrates of different uh, sensitivity that you can use. So for rarer proteins, you can go ahead and use uh, the maximum sensitivity substrates like Clarity Max from Biorad, for example. It's also important to know that if, let's say you did a blot, you uh, detected that with Clarity or a regular ECL substrate and you didn't get a proper result, just dumping in the high sensitivity substrate is not gonna yield a good blot. You need to be cognizant that your secondary antibody dilution might need to be lesser for the higher sensitivity substrate or it's going to come completely blow up your blood. We also have something new that I'm going to talk about in, in just a minute, which is a, a, a novel fluorophore star bright, which allows high sensitivity western blotting using fluorescence. Uh, we also have something that's um, pretty cool. It's a directly tagged primary antibody, and we just have the monovalent fab fragment of that antibody tagged to rhodamine for easy one-step detection of your housekeeping protein. Um, Fluorescence has certain benefits. It just has a wider linear range because you're not dependent on HRP enzyme kinetics, as well as it allows multiplexing, therefore saving you sample, reagents, time, and so on. You can actually check out um, you know, th these links to find out more.
on our website. Just to give you a quick sense of how sensitive these can be, um, these, this is the far red emitting star bright molecule. Think of it like uh, a beads on a string um, which can do intramolecular energy transfer. And you have multiple donors and acceptors, so it's really a bright molecule. And the difference between a traditional antibody is that that's your antibody and that's your fluorophore, whereas here that's the, the nanoparticle star bright tagged to uh, primary, uh, pr secondary antibodies, IgGs. Uh, so when you detect, you get a, a very highly sensitive method of protein detection. So if you look at the, the picograms um, of um, limit of detection, and you compare that to your most sensitive ECL detection method, this actually surpasses your ECL, max sensitivity ECL sometimes, depending on the target actually, and your primary antibody sensitivity as well. Um, this is a direct uh, you know, competitor that uh, emits in the green range, and you can see how much more sensitive it is in 20 seconds, and you really hardly can detect anything in that 488 channel there. Um, here, we are obviously much more sensitive in the far red, uh, near infrared channel as well. So this is a nice way of detecting those rare proteins that you've been struggling and they've been evading you for a while. I looked at posters since yesterday, and I saw a lot of these kinds of posters. So current practice is that people are typically detecting from two proteins to up to eight proteins on uh, using a single sample and then running one blot and just cutting and cutting and cutting away. Um, this is not really best practice. We have all done it. I have, I have multiple publications that look like that, but you know, as t better technology becomes available, you want to make full use of that and do better quantitation, uh, which this, is not this method is not really that suited for. So I want to show you a better way of doing it where you can actually detect multiple proteins simultaneously without either cutting or um, stripping a blot. Um, this is from, the, from a HeLa cell lysate, four endogenously expressed proteins detected on the same blot. Remember, you need really good, highly sensitive primary antibodies to achieve that. You know, if your primary antibody is not good enough and you're not sure what it's binding to, this is not possible. Um, and we have a whole line of primary antibodies for Western blotting that we have developed with a lot of care and only 10% of antibodies that we start with end up becoming this precision ab antibody line. So you might wanna check that out as well. Uh, typically, chemiluminescence will give you one target at a time. Traditional fluorescence on multiple different uh, commercially available imaging platforms can image two at a time. And now Biorad's um, method allows you to do you know, much more than that. And this is a nice application where you can see there's no way, however um, skilled I am at cutting a membrane, there's no way I could have cut out uh, between these two and actually detected the yellow, um, the green and the red, and the yellow is the merged version of that. So you're going to miss out on some biology there if you were going to cut this membrane and do ARC and phosphoarc separately, right? So it's really important to know that you can do much more and get much more biologically relevant and quantitative data if you, if you really adopt these new kinds of technologies available for detection and quantification. Stripping reprobing, this is not a go-to method. We do not want to advocate that because there needs to be a lot of diligence around this. I know a lot of people detect their target of interest and then strip and look for the housekeeping protein. That's sometimes okay, but you really run the risk of uh, stripping proteins as well, not just the antibody itself from that membrane. So you want to be careful about that. So best practices is to test efficiency of your stripping before you go ahead and reprobe. Uh, you really need to double check and prove that you have stripped only the antibodies and not the proteins from your membrane. Um, it's also important to know that your detection method is compatible with stripping, because if you're using some of these uh, colorimetric types of substrates, they are not compatible with stripping. Uh, it's important to keep the blot wet and to remember to re-block. This is really important, because a lot of times you forget to re-block, go back, dump the antibody in there, and it's just a completely blown up membrane. So instead of doing all of this and relying on your cutting abilities, it's better to adopt you know, multiplexing and fluorescence when possible. Why normalize a Western blot? Now I'm going a little bit into quantitation. I won't dwell on this a lot because there's a poster that I want you guys to probably uh, try and make it uh, to this poster. It's board number 303, and it'll be there, the author will be there tomorrow. We're talking about considerations for Western blot normalization techniques. And the main reason why you normalize, I'll give you a quick spiel today, and you can learn more about it at that poster. Uh, is to be confident that the difference in the signal intensities you're seeing for your target protein is actually biology and not you know, manual technique differences or just differences in expression in that cell sample.
And we have a bunch of webinars here that you can also check out uh, to learn more about normalization and how best to do it. So if I asked you the question, who is a better jumper, just giving you data how long, how high or how long the grasshopper can jump versus the human, you're going to have a hard time giving me an answer. But now if I actually gave you the height of these two and gave you a ratio of how high they can jump versus their um, body length, you're going to actually have a better understanding of their jumping ability. So that's what normalization does for you. You're looking at the actual biology of that poor protein uh, and not just variability due to you know, loading differences or cellular expression differences. And it's really important to stick to being within the linear regime of loading. A lot of times, I, this paper is uh, this um, picture is out of a Nature paper recently that came out, and you can see that the actin is completely overloaded and saturated. So how are you going to be quantifying your protein of interest if your actin is all completely saturated and in this part of the uh, loading regime? So it's important to be in that linear portion uh, for signal intensity to be proportional to the expression level. And there are two ways of doing this. This is the traditional way where you're detecting a housekeeping protein um, and normalizing against that versus the stain-free method that I talked to you about where the gel itself allows you and the membrane itself allows you to detect the amount of total protein instead of just relying on one single protein that you're normalizing to. And journals right now are moving more towards a total protein or multiple protein normalization. And the reason for that is two. One is you need to prove that your housekeeping protein loading is still in the linear regime. And number two, you need to prove that any treatments you have done during your experiments have not changed the expression level of that housekeeping protein. So if I looked at uh, typical loading amounts from 10 to 50 micrograms, the stain-free method is actually more linear than housekeeping um, protein normalization. Now, like I already mentioned, housekeeping protein normalization will work only if your signal intensity from both the target protein of interest as well as your housekeeping signal is in the linear regime. So like I mentioned right now, uh, journals like JVC, for example, are promoting using total protein normalization. And there are more and more journals taking this up on this. I recently saw a Nature paper where the authors normalized against, against four different proteins. So instead of doing all that extra work, it's really nice to be able to do a stain-free, just a quick imaging. You're not doing any extra steps to be able to image your gel and your membrane. And you can use other kinds of stains as well. There are methods to stain your uh, membrane um, so that you can detect total protein signal. A quick uh, last note uh, I want to leave you with is, is this where if you were quantifying your, uh, your proteins typically with a primary antibody and then a HRP tag, secondary antibody, and loading somewhere between 2.5 to 20 micrograms of lysate, this is where you run into saturation. And typically to detect your target protein of interest, you would be in this regime anyway. But if you use this um, HFAB rhodamine primary antibodies, which are basically the monovalent FAB fragment from their tag to a rhodamine molecule, you just add this antibody at the level at the time when you're incubating your target protein secondary antibody. So it's just a quick spike into the same solution, and you are able to detect um, your housekeeping protein in a linear way. And it's because it's fluorescence, it's much more linear. It's a single step detection method. It's also um, a human FAB, a FAB uh, antibody that's uh, developed with recombinant antibody technology. Hence, it does not cross-react to your usually used secondary antibodies that you're using for your target. So you, if you're using a mouse or a rabbit or a hamster or a sheep, you don't need to worry about cross-reactivity if you're going to use this method. So to conclude, Western blotting is as much art as it is science, and we all know that. There are some people in the lab using the same reagents who get a little bit better data, better looking, prettier looking blots uh, than, than some of us, right? So it's really important to understand that and optimize technique, right, from cell, um, you know, how we are treating your cells to how you are actually creating a solubilized lysate to loading and every step along the way. Keys to success, really careful consideration of your conditions that you are solubilizing your protein, uh, proteins with, you're quantifying your protein with, as well as method consistency in terms of casting your gels to using the membrane and the detection method. It's also important to uh, you know, be cognizant of newer methods of both uh, detection reagents as well as imaging platforms that can help you do better, more quantitative Western blotting.